Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Amelia Cleveland Trailer. This is my husband, Michael, and uh, we've been away from you all for about three years. We now live in San Antonio, Texas, but we are as pleased as punch to be with you today uh, because there really is no place like home. It has warmed our hearts to be here. So we, thank you. We have the privilege today of sharing with you the Word of God, and we are going to be reading verses from John chapter 4. Jesus left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, uh, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The, the water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up e to eternal life. The woman s said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to come drawing water, uh, coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on the mountain, but you say the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, I, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. But the hour is coming and now is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came, and they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left the water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on, his, on their way to him. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I'd ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. And now Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. So good to be with you. So good to have uh, Pastor Mike and Pastor Emilio back. If you don't know, they served our church faithfully as pastors of discipleship. And uh, we're just like Vondra, scooted out to widen the circle. Uh, and they're doing so in Texas and just so glad to be there. Um, my cup is full today. 
It's just full. I mean, you know, with comings and goings and opportunities for baptism, it's full. But you know what the psalmist said when your cup is full? Anybody? It runs over. The old King James runneth over. So we used to have an old corny song in the church. We'd say, fill my cup. And then the next line was, let it overflow. I want you to do that. I'm going to say, fill my cup. And you say, let it overflow. Ready? Online, in your living room. If you're driving, it's okay. People will think you're a little weird, but I preach to my steering wheel all the time. Ready? Fill my cup. That's what I want to talk to you about today, overflowing. Overflowing with the grace and the goodness and the love and the peace and the power of God. Our, our vision team has come up with a 10-year vision, uh, thinking that God has called Garfield Memorial Church to be a place of reconciliation. We've talked about a renaissance of reconciliation. We're not going to run from the divisiveness of this world. We're going to run toward it. And we're going to go at it with the life and the love and the power of Jesus Christ. Where there's neither east or west or north or south. Jesus said, in my kingdom, people will come from uh, the right and the left and the up and the down and the, in all the corners of the universe to sit and eat. That means be in fellowship together in the kingdom of God. And we're going we're gonna to be so outrageous at this church that we're going to model that like it's true. Right? Like the trajectory of the church, Revelation 7, 9, where every people, tongue, nation, and tribe will, will be before the Lord. And they, our vision team has said to us, how do we measure that? How do we measure what we're doing? And that's why we're in this teaching series, Weighed in the Balance. That comes from Daniel 5, verse 27. I don't have enough time to talk about. Um, but we take measures. How are we doing? How many of you hate to get on a scale? I like really hate that, but I have to do it. Right? You get blood pressure, right? You're, you're just checking in. This isn't do we measure up. Up. My God, people are, are, you know, driving themselves into the grave because they're so worried whether you measure up. I hate to mention this to you, but it's not about your accomplishments. You know, you can't take that with you. It's what God has accomplished on our behalf in Jesus Christ. So this isn't about what do we measure up, but it's how am I growing? How am I becoming more into the likeness of Christ? How are the fruits of the Spirit growing within me? So our vision team said four questions. We're on question three today. I'm going to talk about uh, the first part of it this week. Pastor Terry will talk about it next week. The first measure was love. We talked about this in two parts. How am I loving my neighbor? Now don't stop there. The way God loves them. This isn't Hallmark love. This is forbearing, going the distance love. How am I loving my neighbor the way God loves him? Last week, we talked about humility. And we said, you can't talk to anybody about humility because if you go to somebody and ask them about how they're so humble, if they answer, you have to go talk to somebody else. <laughs> humility, how am I putting the needs of others ahead of my own needs? And today, the, la the third leg of the stool is sharing. How am I overflowing? How has my cup been filled and it's overflowing to the lives of others? How am I sharing the good news of God's love for, you see that word? All people. <laughs> you remember Jesus, he sent his disciples out and he said, go into the world and make disciples of who? All. Right, you know what the word all means in the Greek language? Yeah, it means all. Pastor Lori knows that. It means all. Like, not some. Go and make disciples of some people. People that look like you and vote like you and act like you. Go and overflow to all people. How am I doing that? So I turn to this story of the woman of the well. I, I've been preaching every Sunday now for 31 years, and I've probably preached on this sister 31 times. I think it's once a year. I'm so sure I, if I ever make it to heaven, I hope I do. I'm, I'm, I'm working on that, right? Uh, I think I'm going to know her. <laughs> like she's unnamed. I'm going, oh, that's you. I preached about you for 31 years. I think this encounter is amazing. And I'm going to do two things with it today about sharing your faith. I want to talk to you about a party principle and a party invitation. Now, for those of you who are like, that's not very religious, okay, a kingdom consciousness and a kingdom encounter, but I'm gonna stay with the first part. A party principle and a party invitation. The kingdom of God is a party. That was a book written by my, one of my mentors, Tony Campolo. 
And I thought about that years ago. I was um, in Williamsburg, Virginia. I was at a conference called the Festival of Homiletics, right? It was a preaching conference, but us religious people have to, we, we can't just say it's, it's a preaching conference. We have to say it's a festival of homiletics. And the world goes, huh? Like, yeah. But I went there, and uh, my mentor, Dr. Tom Long, one of my homiletics preachers, teachers, was there. And I was graduating from seminary, so I tagged along. And I went to the hotel I was staying, and I went to the elevator, and then on the elevator was taped like this handwritten note that said, in pen, said, party in room 210. <laughs> Everybody invited, 8 p.m. That's pretty cool, man. I got on the elevator, I went up to my room, and I thought, man, isn't that interesting? I wonder who's gonna be in room 8, 210 tonight at 8 p.m. <laughs> Like the couple that was sightseeing and they're getting bored with it. The salesperson that was on the road and getting kind of tired of call after call after call. Somebody making a long journey across the country has stopped in and said, hey, maybe I'll stop for a moment of festivity. Children who saw the sign who were going to sneak out of their parents' rooms to see what the heck is going on in room 210. And when I went back down to dinner that night, 6 o'clock, I was to meet uh, Dr. Long. And I looked on the elevator and the sign was gone. And in its place was an officially typed song, sign, song, excuse me, sign, that said uh, the notice about the party in room 10 was a hoax, signed the management. And I kind of felt a little, I felt a little depressed about that, man. You know, I like, and I went down to dinner and I told Dr. Long about it and I said, uh, you know, this is what I saw. And, and uh, I said, can you imagine, a, you know, it's a party where it doesn't matter how we got there. We're all invited. And Dr. Long says something to me I'll never forget. He said, perhaps if there's ever going to be a party like that, the church will have to throw it. That's the party principle that we have to have. See, because when you have that fact that you're not the host of the party, you're not in charge of the party, right? You're just an invited guest. And if you know you're going to go, you see people differently because you know they're on the guest list too. And who knows that the host might not seat you next to one another. And so you behave that way. One of my mentors, Dr. Gerald Mann, used to say, if I get to heaven and I care who's there, I'm not in heaven. <laughs> right? And, and so we have that principle, this party principle. And that's why Jesus had that in his mind. Jesus loved a good party. That's why his first miracle in John's gospel was what? Turning water into wine. My Southern Baptist friends have not forgiven him for that. But, you know, he was at a wedding and he was, he was festive and he didn't want the host to be embarrassed. And, and, and he was there to experience life. The, in the Jewish halakha, it says where there's no wine, there's no joy. It was a symbol of joy. He was in this place. He said, I come that my joy might be in you. In fact, the, the religious people were so uptight about him, they called him a, a glutton and a drunkard. They called him a friend of sinners as a criticism, and Jesus took it as a compliment. And he sat at table with you and with me, even in our, even in our dark times, even when we don't measure up because he loved the party. And he had what I say, be kingdom conscious, right? He had a kingdom consciousness. In fact, every time Jesus opened his mouth, he talked about the kingdom. And the kingdom was a place of a messianic banquet. The kingdom was a place where people would come, I said, north and south and east and west, sit and eat and fellowship together in God's kingdom. He was so conscious of the kingdom, every time Jesus opened his mouth, he talked about it. The kingdom of heaven is like somebody that found buried treasure in a field. Looked ordinary, looked common, but they found it, and in their joy sold everything they had to be in that field. Kingdom of heaven is like a father with two sons. One of them stuck up and one's an idiot, but he loves them both. <laughs> and Luke said the kingdom of heaven is like a party. Read it, where everybody's invited, but very few come and the Father's heart is broken. See, we have to have this consciousness to share our faith, that this is who we are, and, and this is what we've been invited to, and guess what? Everyone else has been invited too, right? I don't care if the management tears down the sign. I don't care if political parties tear down the sign. I don't care if, 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 if any tyrant of this world tears down the sign. There is a party in the heavenly room 210 on earth as it is in heaven, and we're invited. We're invited. Oh, before you cheer that, the person you dislike the most is invited too. 
Nobody cheered for that one, did you? I, you, 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 you got my mentorship, you know. But this is the consciousness we have to have. And this is the consciousness Jesus had when he went into Samaria. The last place a Jewish person would be caught dead in Samaria. Samaritans and Jews hated one another. It's a history, if you know, it was a, it was a race war. All right, it was, a, it was a result of racism. It's not new, right? The Samaritans had intermarried with the Assyrians and the Jews hated that because they were of impure blood, right? And isn't it interesting when Jesus said the person that acted the proper way was a Samaritan? <laughs> Remember that parable, the good Samaritan? In that day and age, Jewish people would have never put good and Samaritan in the same sentence. In fact, the guy who was the preacher, who was taught the parable of the good Samaritan, when Jesus said, who was the neighbor to that person? He couldn't even say the word Samaritan. He said, the one who showed kindness. See, this was hatred. Hatred. And it says, look at this verse, if you heard it read when Scott, uh, Mike and Amelia read it for you. It says, Jesus left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. Now, those of us from Northeastern Ohio, we think, okay, I'm going from Cleveland to Canton. I have to go through Akron, right? Do you drive another way? Y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> Right, you go north to south, and I, when I first read this before I went to seminary, before I studied the language and the, you know, the, um, you know, the, the study of the land, I thought that's what it meant. Do you know there is no geographic reason that Jesus would have to go through Samaria to get to Galilee? In fact, for the Bible to say that Jesus was going from Jerusalem, Judea, to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria, it would be like me saying to you, "Hey, I have to go to Toledo today, but I have to drive through Toronto, Ontario." But geographically, that's, that's, that's actually correct. Why did he have to go? Because there was one woman, abused, disenfranchised, marginalized, stigmatized by society, who didn't know she was invited to the party, and Jesus had to go. One person left off the guest list, one person beaten by this world to think that they have no place at God's table is too much for the Son of Man to bear. And he had to go. He had an appointment with her, and she was late, so he just sat down and waited. Do you see how intense he is to, to, to let us know? The overflow of Jesus' life. Jesus was the gospel of God. Jesus was God in the flesh. He was showing us the overflow of God's love. That though he was high in the heaven, what did we say last week? Humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant. Emptied himself of power, position, and privilege. Not to be king of the hill, but to be king of the world, as I said last week. And lift us up into the high places. And so he goes into Samaria, and here it is. Now, in the Jewish law, you did not, as a man, speak to a woman unless that woman was your wife in public. And even then, the guys kind of talk to each other. It's like Browns fans. <laughs> My brother-in-law's here. That was for him. Um, you know, the guys talk to guys, right? And you talk to women at home. You didn't do that. That was, that was a violation of the law. And Jews did not speak to Samaritans. And that's why this woman says, how is it that you, a man, and a Jewish rabbi speak to me, did you hear it? A woman from Samaria. We have a boundary-breaking God. He is not constricted by the world, rules of this world. And here, this woman has been scandalized. Now, let me tell you something. If you grew up in Sunday school or you've been around church and you ever heard this preached on, you have been taught something that's biblically inaccurate. You've been told this woman was a sinner woman. She was a harlot. She was keeping up with the, I won't say their name. You know, it was a woman went from man to man to man to man. That is such a lie. The only reason it's been preached that way is because men have preached on it through the years. It's the only reason, really, mostly white dudes. Right, people in privilege that are able to preach about this. And I, what bugs me is this woman has not only been violated by her community, she's been violated by the church. Here's the truth, right? Online, trust me, women did not have that kind of power 
in first century, they were not able to divorce their husbands. It was impossible. This is a woman who's been handed from man to man to man to man, treated like a piece of chattel. She has been sex trafficked. She has been scandalized. She has been victimized. And Jesus reaches through the racism and the sexism and the discrimination and the vulnerability of the world to touch her. Do you realize how many layers God is willing to go through to touch you? And we can't get out of our own way to touch others? I mean, this is the overflow that we have to know in our life. What does it mean sharing? It means a party principle and a party invitation that we are out modeling the love and the, and the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. See, some people say, I don't want to share my face. It's like, you know, that's so pompous. Look at this is not religious proselytizing. One of the things Jesus does is he shows the woman that the world has no ladders. See, we live in a world of ladders. Haven't you been taught to climb the corporate ladder? You know one of the best advices I got even when I was in the corporate arena? It said, uh, if you're climbing the ladder, make sure you know what wall it's leaning up against. <laughs> that one got my attention, right? We, we, Jesus said this world doesn't have ladders. See, and religion is ladders. Religion is climb the ladders, do the work. That's what religion say. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Then God will love you and God will take you to heaven. That's why the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a religion. God is not religious. He's not, that's not, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't do these things and then God will love you. It said, no, Jesus has done those things. Right? See, this woman is so hung up on religion. She's been so messed up in addition to everything else. Look at the, the, the conversation. She goes, well, our people worship on the mountain. Like, our people worship with guitars and, and uh, keyboards. Our people worship with choirs, with long flowing robes. Our people worship with handbells. Our people talk to everybody. Our people don't speak to anyone. You know, all this stuff. She's caught up in it. All this stuff. You know, uh, she's at Jacob's well. That's like being at the Vatican or being in Jerusalem or, for, or a Muslim, being in Mecca. We're at Jacob's well. Jesus said, yeah, but you keep going back to that well, you will be thirsty. You keep trying to follow the Ten Commandments perfectly and earn your way into heaven and you'll never get there. But receive the gift. The gift, that's what he kept saying, the water that I will give you. Not that you will earn. This isn't a wage, right? If you're trying to get a wage, how, how, do, you, uh, how do you not get a wage? You don't do the work, right? You don't deserve a wage. How do you not get a gift? You have to be pride and go, I don't want charity. See, the only thing that gets in the way of our relationship with God is pride. Trying to be our own Savior and Lord. This woman had been manipulated. She'd been abused. She'd been conditioned to the world. And Jesus says, she goes, oh, it sounds like you're a, a smart preacher. You're a prophet. Uh, but the Messiah someday will come. And she goes, I'm it. I'm the one. I've come to bring you what you really need. See, if we're going to share our faith, we got to know what we're sharing. We're not sharing Garfield. We're not sharing Methodism. We're not sharing Pentecostalism. We're not sharing any ism. We're sharing Jesus. Come and meet this man. <laughs> Come and meet this one who gave me everything I was ever looking for, who told me everything about my life, right? And, and, and finally, you know, the, the gift we all need, what Jesus comes to give, what we're sharing, is a gift of living water. Jesus is basically says to us, right, this is his gift. I have something for you you're so desperately for phys uh, spiritually as you are for water physically. How many of you know that you can live with a lot of things, but you can't live without water? Right, 50% more of our bodies are water. I, 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 you know, if you're stranded in the ocean, you're stranded in the desert, you die of thirst, it's a horrible death. I actually did some study this week of physiologically, what is this whole thing about being thirsty and right now God said take a drink, I don't know why. Actually my mouth, had, <laughs> my mouth got dry. My wife hates when I do that. On, she's like, everybody on TV has to wait for you. Sorry team. <laughs> Here's how, here's how you die of thirst, right? The, the physiologist, the medical community tells us that there's four stages, they use Greek words. The first one is called dipsogenic. All of, all of us dipsogenic, it means 
thirst provoking. We live in a, you know, as bodies, physical beings, dipsogenic all the time. We have thirst, right? But sometimes it goes to, uh, you know, and we live in the eudipsia, I'm sorry, which is ordinary thirst. That's what I just drank. My mouth drank too much coffee. You get a little parched, right? But there's a place where you can get hyperdipsia, which is intense thirst. It's temporary. You're working out. You're doing yard work. It's a high sun. You ever been in those times? You just need a cool drink. That's hyperdipsia. But when you're really in trouble, is polydipsia. This is what will kill you. This is sustained excessive thirst. And I'm very struck by that word poly. If you know anything about the word poly, like uh, poly, polygamy, uh, I can't even say the word. Um, you have a lot of spouses. Uh, polytheism, you have a lot of gods. Poly, like you're so thirsty, you'll turn to anything. You'll turn to anything. See, this is why Jesus says, go get your husband. He's not rubbing her nose in her condition. She's been scandalized. He's saying the world says, go get this husband and that husband and this wife and that wife and this job and that job and this bank account and this stock, and then you won't be thirsty. So Jesus said, how's that working out for you? How's it working out for you? We're chasing after so many things to solve a thirst that only God can finally bring. He said, you are so spiritually thirsty. When families today were baptized two young people, why are they coming up today? What is this, like fire insurance? Like we don't preach, oh my gosh, if your child's not baptized, they go to hell. What kind of God would do that? Like I, I don't, I'm sorry, that goes against everything I ever knew. Where families are saying, this is the water my child is gonna need. Whether you know that or not, that's what you're doing. That they're gonna be thirsty if they don't get to this water. That I'm gonna be thirsty if I don't get to this water. Jesus said, if you don't drink of the water that I bring, you will always be thirsty. Blessed are those, remember, who hunger and thirst for the kingdom, for they shall be filled. This is a drink we really need. In fact, if you get into this polydipsia, I read about a, uh, two individuals who were stranded and died. Their Jeep broke down in the desert of Algeria and they found them later. You know what? They had drunk radiator water to try to stay alive. They drank poison. Jesus said, go get your career. <laughs> go get your family. Go get your education. That's what he says. Is that going to fill you? You're drinking poison because you're so desperate for the water that only I can bring. And that's what we share. We don't, we don't, we don't sit up at the top of the ladder, right? You've got to study this scripture. Like, we got the woman at the well in chapter 4. Do you know what chapter 3 is in John? It's a story in Nicodemus, right? Be born again. We all know that story, right? It's very interesting. Long narratives buttressed right up against one another. One is a guy at the top of the ladder. Nicodemus, he's the lead pastor, he's a superintendent, he's a bishop, he's a moral person, he's, he's an upstanding person, that's what religions say. And people at the top of the ladder, how do they talk to people down at the bottom of the ladder? They're condescending. They say, you don't have the right doctrine, you don't say the right prayers, you don't do the right things. And, and Jesus says, no, I say the prayer for you. Read John 17. I did the right thing for you. Read that. I, it matters what I say about your life. And when Nicodemus, the, 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 the guy at the top of the ladder who comes to Jesus at night because he doesn't want his religious friends to see him, and he opens his mouth, do you realize Jesus won't even let him get a word? He starts to talk and Jesus says, you need to shut up and be born again. You need to start over. You need to become like a child. But the woman who's at the bottom of the ladder, he's so patient with, he's so gentle. Did you hear how long the poor trailers had to read that scripture? Like, you gotta read it all. Because he enters this long discussion with her to show us there's a, there's a thirst you're all after. And if you think you've attained it at the top of the ladder, you're, you're gonna die. And if you're at the bottom of the ladder thinking the world decides who you are, you're going to die there too. But come and give the drink that I offer, right? That's why on a high holy day, I'm going to go to, to John chapter 7. I'm driving the tech team crazy back there. They're like, he's out of order. Um, yeah, and Jesus was out of order too because he was at a religious festival. Watch this. The last day of the festival, the great day. This is Easter for Christians. This is Yom Kippur for Jews. This is Ramadan for our Islamic brothers and sisters. This is the high holy day. And can you imagine we're here at Christmas Eve or Easter and all of a sudden Jesus in a least likely form stands up and screams. Says he cried out. That means he shrieked. What? Let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Not to church. 
not to confession, not to communion, as wonderful as that is, not to those, those things are wonderful vessels to bring you to me, but they're not me. Come to me and drink what out of your heart shall flow rivers of living water. I wanna end with this. Notice what Jesus said to that woman in John 4, the next slide. He says, I, the, the water I give will be a spring. You know what that word spring literally means? In the Greek, it means fountain. I'll prov- I'll, I'm going to put a fountain in you that's going to overflow. It's not just going to feed your thirst. It's going to feed the thirst of the world. It's going to flow out into the lives of others. This is, this is what God does. If you're not overflowing with the love and the grace and the, and the peace and the power of God, um, You know, maybe you're religious, but have an encounter with this one. He will fill your cup so much that it will overflow. He wants to put in us a fountain. And look at this woman. I love this verse. It says that she left her water jar. I never saw that before. I love the the word of God. It just, like, after she got this drink, she didn't need her water jar anymore. To leave your water jar in the desert in Israel is like suicide. But she said, I got water (laughs) that I've never had before. And she went back to the city, the city who had oppressed her, the city who had marginalized her, the city that made her go out and get water by herself in the middle of the day, what no person would have done in that day and age. She had so much in her that she couldn't help. I think somewhere David said, he prepares a place for me even in the presence of those who don't like me very much. And I'm gonna overflow into their lives. See, this is what God wants to do. He wants to put a fountain in us. Um, oh gosh, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm gonna be in trouble, but that's okay, she'll forgive me. My wife has said to me, quit talking stories about me so much. Um, I have one more, honey, I promise. Next week I won't. But you know, I'm married to a woman who's a fountain because she's been filled by God. And I, this happened to me, you know, we weren't going to a restaurant for over a year, just like everybody else. And when the weather turned nice, we were eating outdoors and we wanted to go out and eat on a patio. And we went to a local restaurant and we went in and my wife went in and there was a young adult, a hostess there. And my wife knew instinctively something I would have missed if she had been crying. And she never said hi, she didn't do anything. She made a beeline to this woman, she put her arms on her and she says, honey, what's wrong? And they sat and the woman cried with Terry, and then next thing I know, Terry said, I'll be with you later, Chip, and she's out. She, seriously, she's out in the car, and she's getting our personal cards, and here's our number, and here's the church, and, and we want you to know you're loved. And honey, if you're watching online right now, I want you to know that was a fountain of living water. It wasn't her, it was Jesus. And, and she can't help it, because it just overflows. See, that's who we're called to be, like this woman was. She just received a gift of water, and it overflowed in her life. And as we celebrate baptism today, you know, uh, when Terry and I, when we go to weddings and we're not, I'm not officiating, we have friends or, you know, children of friends, every time it comes to the vows, you know, do you take this person to be your, you know, all the vows, you know what, we do it all the time. We just reach over and take each other's hands and we say them again. I hope when you hear these vows of baptism today, you'll say them again, you'll recommit to drink that water, this water of this font, this overflowing water that will fill in the gaps and the hurts in your life. You won't worship, wor- worry about whether you're worshiping on the mountain or worshiping in a traditional service or worshiping in a modern service. You'll just say, like Jesus said, my, my people worship in spirit and in truth. They can worship me wherever they are, wherever you are right now online. And take that water and let overflow. Let me close with this. God said through Jeremiah, these words. He said, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, what? The fountain of living water. And they've dug up for themselves cisterns. They've digging for water, broken cisterns that can hold no water. When Jesus says, go get your husband, he's not, he's not taunting her. He's not rubbing her nose in anything. He said, go get those things that you've been trying to get water for him those broken cisterns. And be honest with me, have they filled you yet? But come to me, the fountain of living waters, as we celebrate baptism today. And I will fill you and fill your cup until it, let it be dear Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Terry, come as we are led to baptism.